Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jogler66 for another reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tupper Saucy. Last time we continued the reading, um, except from my confession that I made at the end, <laughs> uh, at the end of chapter 12, and now I will start reading chapter 13 called The Secret Bridge. And that starts with a little quote from the Revolutionary Brotherhood from 1996 by Stephen C. Bullock. Quote, the papal prohibition might even have encouraged masonry by identifying opposition to the group with Catholic tyranny and superstition. Unquote. The new Catholic encyclopedia identifies the men who attacked the Society of Jesus as, quote, the radical devotees of the rationalistic enlightenment, Richly talented and influential writers such as Voltaire, Rousseau and other philosophies, among the encyclopedists, the followers of Freemasonry and high-placed government officials, unquote. Attacking the Jesuits was for them, quote, a step toward their ultimate objective of abolishing all religious orders, the papacy and finally the church itself, unquote. The masterpiece of the encyclopedists, most of whom happened to be philosophies, was the monumental Encyclopedia of Sciences, Arts and Trades, published 1743 to 1751. The encyclopedia was the flame of the Enlightenment, the fulfillment of Cardinal Wolsey's dream of flooding the world with print containing learning against learning. It brought so much learning, secular learning that is, <clears throat> as against scriptural learning, as you understood learning of learning, as I explained earlier in an earlier chapter, that it became its own paradigm demanding radical change in existing norms. The Enlightenment called for a new age that placed reason above any church, above even the Bible. The New Age issued in the elegant neo-Gnostic religion of Deism, the thinking of man's alternative to Roman Catholicism and its imperious hold on the human conscience. Nowhere was Deism more methodically practiced as than, quote, around the altars of Freemasonry, unquote, as the great Masonic scholar Albert Pike put it. Here, wrote Pike in his influential Morals and Dogma in 1871, quote, The Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucius and Zoroaster can assemble as brethren and unite in prayer to the one God who is above all gods. The brethren prayerful climb the Gnostic pyramid of successive illumination until, hopefully, a oneness with the Supreme God is attained. As Pike explained, the Deists, like the Papacy, looked upon the Bible as something on a stumbling of a stumbling block. The Freemason does not pretend to dogmatic certain uh, to does not pretend to dogmatic certainty, nor vainly imagine such certainty attainable. He considers that if there are no written revelation, there were no written revelation, he could safely rest the hopes that animate him and the principles that guide him on the deductions of reason and the convictions of instinct and consciousness. He studies the wonders of the heavens, the framework and revolutions of the earth, the mysterious beauties and adaptations of animal existence, the moral and material constitution of the human creature, so fearfully and wonderfully made, and is satisfied that God is... Point, 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 point. So that was a little quotation from Albert Pike, his book. Most of the philosophies, including Frederick the Great, the Protestant King of Prussia, who subsidized the entire encyclopedia, project were deistic brethren, as were the high placed government official high placed government officials who pushed the for the de establishment of the Jesuits. All the Bourbon monarchs employed 
as their official advisors, ardent members of the Lodge, to use Professor Martin's phrase. The Marquis de Pombal of Portugal was a mason. Charles III's advisor, the Count of de Randa, Louis XV's minister, de Tio, and the Duc de Choiseul, as well as Maria Theresa's prince from, uh, von Kaunitz and Gerard von Sweden, all belonged to the secret brotherhood. Since it was no secret that the Enlightenment aimed to make Roman Catholicism passé, Pope Clement XII promulgated in 1728 the Constitution, in eminenti, which appeared to condemn Freemasonry thusly. Quote, Condemnatio societis de conventiculorum de Freemasons under the penalty IPSO ipso facto incurred or excommunication, absolution from it being reserved to Pontifex Maximus. I'm going to repeat that last little paragraph here from uh, what Pope Clement uh, promulgated in the 1728 Constitution in Eminenti once again, because that was not so easy to read, so I hope you will understand it better when I read it for the second time. Condemnatio societatis de conventiculorum, the Freemasons, meaning under the penalty ipso facto incurred, or excommunication, absolution from it being reserved to Pontifex Maximus. Unquote. Freemasons, of whatever sect or religion, confederate together in a close and inscrutable bond, according to secret laws and orders agreed upon between them, and bind themselves as well by strict oath taken on the Bible as by the imprecations of heavy punishments to, de to preserve their mysteries with inviolable secrecy. The great mischiefs which generally accrue from secret bodies are antagonist to civil and canonical laws. Wherefore, by the advice of the cardinals and of our mere motion, and from the plen plenitude of the apostolic power, we do condemn and prohibit the meetings of the above-named Society of Freemasons. We strictly command that no one, under any pretext or color, dare to presume to promote, favor, admit or conceal in their houses members of assemblies of this abominable order, nor in any way aid or assist in their meeting in any place, or to administer medicine to them in their sickness, or in any manner, directly or indirectly, by themselves or others, afford them counsel or help in that hour of trial and affliction, or persuade others to join said order. While Eminenti's stern rhetoric, which was renewed by Benedict XIV in 1751, seems to dig a wide ocean between Catholicism and Freemasonry, its fruits tell another story. Why, for example, were the Bourbon monarchs, all of them Roman Catholics, never penalized or excommunicated for admitting, promoting and favoring Masonic advisors? And why, a decade after the Marquis de Pombal had shipped the Jesuits out of Portugal, did Clement XIV send an appeasing nuncio to the Portuguese court, elevate Pombal's brother to bishop, and confirm all Pombal's nominees in, uh, nominees in uh, Bishop Briggs. The answer, of course, is contained in the bull's title, which provides that absolution from penalties or excommunication is, quote, reserved to Pontifex Maximus, unquote. That is to say, associating with the abomination of Freemasonry if done for a cause valuable to the papacy, such as weakening the Jesuits to the point everybody assumes they are no longer a threat to Protestantism, will be absolved by the papacy. Given the historical context, does any other answer make sense? The leading Jesuit bishops were not only Freemasons, they were also the product of Jesuit learning against learning. It was the ratio studiorum, 
the Medici Library's Gnostic wisdom absorbed in an ambience of casuistry, equivocation, mental reservation and obedience of the understanding combined with the smatterings of holy scripture usually filtered through the commentaries of church doctors that had turned two centuries of Jesuit students, Jesuit students into secular philosophies. The ratio studiorum dictated the form and scope of the encyclopedia, which in turn codified the Enlightenment uh, paradigm, whose deistic litany was preached, quote, around the altars of Freemasonry. Unquote. Hold Freemasonry up to the light and you cannot help but see the black papacy's watermark. Isn't it reasonable, given the circumstances, that the G in the center of the familiar Masonic emblem represents the initial of Jesu, G-E-S-U, Jesu, the residence of the black popes at the Jesuits' world headquarters at number 5, Borgio Sancto Spiritu, in Rome? Freemasons wouldn't suspect this, nor would Jesuits. It would be information reserved uniquely to the unknown superior, who shares what he knows with no one. Quote, Your enemies will serve you without their wishes, said Sun Tzu, or even their knowledge. Unquote. Freemasonry was the natural, the reasonable, the only intelligent way for the Roman Catholic Church to control a the ongoing affront of Protestantism, b. the increase in quote-unquote divine right, kings heading their own national churches independent of Vatican control, and c. the incredible explosion of international mercantilism. Like the aquatic creature whose mouth resembles a comfortable resting place to its prey, the lodges were a sagacious recycling of old Templar infrastructure into a dynamic spiritual and economic brotherhood that gave Protestants, Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, agnostics and anyone else an opportunity to build a better life outside Roman Catholicism, yet still under the Church's superintending eye. For Sun Tzu said, uh, quote, The General sees all, hears all, does all, and an appearance is not involved with anything." Unquote. The Jesuit general is the disembodied eye substituting for the pyramid's missing, missing capstone, the stone the builders rejected. The lodge's secrecy and its condemnation by the church were essential to sustaining the integrity of both institutions. And so the deepest Masonic secret, the secret that not even their grand, grandest masters could penetrate, was that all their secrets were known to one man alone, the superior general of the Society of Jesus. This should not surprise anyone aware of how thoroughly Freemasonry is suffused with Jesuitic technique. Both Freemasonry, <coughs> excuse me, both Freemasonry and the Society of Jesus are a. a humanist religious orders, b. secretive, c. fraternal, and d socially conscientious and politically active, questing, like uh, Aenas, the prototypical Roman, for the greatest good of the greatest number. Both orders, e, hold tradition, reason and experience in equal, if not greater esteem, than the Bible. f, employ carefully structured programs of Gnostic visualization to achieve an ever-increasing knowledge of the divine. g. Condone, quote, the end justifies the means, unquote, and h. Require absolute obedience, secured by a blood oath, to a hierarchy of superiors culminating in the Jesuit general, whose orders are so wisely suited to the recipient, that they are obeyed as though willed by the recipient himself. The first recorded member of American Freemasonry was Daniel Cox, who was constituted Provincial Grand Master of the provinces of New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania on June 5, 1730, on a deputation granted by the Duke of Norfolk, Grand Master of Masons in England. Evidently, 
Cox was an industrious recruiter. Minutes of a meeting of the Grand Lodge of London on January 29, 1731 reflect that quote, Cox's health was proposed and drank as provincial Grand Master of North America. Unquote. Daniel Cox was actually a junior, according to Sidney Haynes, Washington and his compeers from 1868. He was, quote, the son of Dr. Daniel Cox of England, who was a physician to the Queen of Charles II. Unquote. Dr. Cox must be presumed a Roman Catholic sympathizer, as both Charles and his Queen were Catholics. The Queen, Catherine of Braganza in Portugal, flaunted a huge Vatican entourage for which she was continually harassed by death plots. Charles converted to Catholicism in exchange for money from Louis XIV of France under the terms of the Treaty of Dover. The junior Daniel Cox deserves wider recognition as an American visionary, or at least the sole apologist of some undisclosed visionary. Thirteen years before Benjamin Franklin's proposal of a quote-unquote colonial union to the Albany Congress in 1754, for which Franklin is credited with being the first to suggest a United States, Cox published in England a dissertation promoting a scheme to settle, quote, an extensive tract of country lying on the Gulf of Mexico, unquote, owned by his father, the Queen's physician. The dissertation, entitled A Description of the English Province of Carolina by the Spaniards called Florida and by the French La Louisiane, promoted the elder Cox's tract as an English province allied with New England against the Spanish, the French and the Indians. It called for, quote, all the colonies appertaining to the crown of Great Britain on the northern continent of America to be united under a legal, regular and firm establishment, over which a lieutenant or supreme governor may be constituted and appointed to preside on the spot, to whom the governors of each colony shall be subordinate. Unquote. With this union of governments under one president, Cox foresaw, quote, a great council or general convention on the states of the colonies, unquote, to, quote, meet together, consult and advise for the good of the whole, unquote. These United Nations, uh, United States, sorry, not United Nations, I'm a little bit too far in the future there. These United States would provide, quote, for their mutual defense and safety, as well as, if necessary, for offense and invasion of their enemies, unquote, independently of the protections of the British crown. Of course, these imaginings became reality 40 years later with the fulfillment of Lorenzo Ricci's strategy for dividing the British Empire. Considering the elements involved, lands owned by the Catholic Queen's physician, lands managed and promoted uh, by the physician's son, who is a Freemason, depu deputed, deputed to generate an American Brotherhood by the 8th Duke of Norfolk, whom himself was a member of England's premier Roman Catholic family. Cox's dissertation appears to be the earliest formatting of the colonial conscience to, device, to divisive thinking by agents of the Black Papacy. The Duke of Norfolk, quote, Grand Master of Masons in England, unquote, was also known as Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel. His nephew, Henry, Lord Arundel, occupied Wardour Castle near Tisbury in Wiltshire at the time Clement XIV disestablished the Jesuits. We shall see how, in the autumn of 1773, it was to Lord Arundel's castle that John Carroll repaired <clears throat> when civil authorities close, close key down closed ah sorry that's a typo here uh, when civil authorities closed down the Jesuit school in Liège Belgium where Carroll had been teaching for a year Carroll stayed at Wardour serving as the Arundel family's tutor and chaplain before sailing for America to participate in the revolution. 33rd degree Masonic scholar Manley P. Hall, in his Gnostic extravaganza, 
the secret teaching of all ages, an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy from 1988, remarked that, quote, not only were many founders of the United States government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few." Unquote. Most histories of the American government skim over the Masonic presence. Americans like their history told <coughs> Americans like their history told in high defini definition icons in good and evil, liberty and tyranny, heroism and treason, might and right. They won't buy a heritage polluted by dark spots of mystery. Yet, the greater part of American governmental heritage is almost wholly mysterious. The man best qualified to become our country's greatest historian, certainly the man with the most complete access to primary sources in the revolutionary cause, was Charles Thompson. An authentic classical scholar, a discreet protestant steeped in Medici learning, Thompson was known as, quote, perpetual secretary of the Continental Congress, unquote. He inscribed minutes of every congressional session from 1774 until ratification of the Constitution in 1789. With William Barton, a Freemason, he designed the Great Seal of the United States of America. The choice of its Virgilian mottos is credited exclusively to Thompson. Among his contemporaries, Charles Thompson's name was synonymous with truce. So accurate were his minutes of Pennsylvania's negotiations with the Delaware Indians that the Delawares called him Wig Wu Lomont, the man who talks the truth. When he would take his daily reports of congressional proceedings to the streets, eager mobs would cry, quote, Here comes Charles Thompson. Here comes the truth." Unquote. Once the Constitution was ratified, Charles Thompson retired to Harriton, his country home in Bryn Mawr. He destroyed his personal papers relative to the creation of the new republic. An article by Kenneth Bowling on the, uh, in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography of 1976 says that Thompson actually wrote a lengthy history of the, of the revolution which he also destroyed. Thompson's biographer, J. Edwin Hendricks of Wake Forest, suggests a fate other than destruction, alluding to, quote, persistent rumors that, Thom that the Thompson papers are in the Pennsylvania Masonic records, unquote. Professor Hendricks assured me personally, this is uh, uh, in the between brackets, a uh, note from Tupper Saucy, Professor Hendricks assured me personally that numerous inquiries have failed to reflect Thompson's membership in Pennsylvania Masonry. <clears throat> End of this note. Whether Thompson destroyed his history or surrendered it to the crypt of secrecy, it is clear that he knew there were certain elements in the formation of American government that must, must be ignored. Quote, if the truth were known, he told friends darkly, many careers would be tarnished and the leadership of the nation would be weakened. Unquote. And so Charles Thompson occupied the remaining 40 years of his life translating the Septuagint, a Greek language Bible, into English. Still, he was frequently requested to write the, definition, uh, the, the definitive insider's history of the revolution. Dr. Benjamin Rush overheard Thompson's reply to one such request and recorded it in his diary. Quote, no, he said, I ought not, for I should contradict all the histories of the great events of the revolution and show by my, by my account of men, motives and measures that we are wholly indebted to the agency of providence for its successful issue. Let the world admire the supposed wisdom and valor of our great man. Perhaps they may adopt the qualities that have been ascribed to them, and thus good may be done. I shall not 
undeceive future generations. Unquote. What I believe Thompson was meaning to say is simply that no historical account of the American Revolution can be truthful unless it discloses the role played by, quote, the agency of, provi uh, of providence, unquote. Notice that Thompson does not use the word providence alone, which was understood in his day to mean God or Christ. He does not say we are wholly indebted to God or we are wholly indebted to Christ, but rather to the agency thereof. If Thompson knew the word agency was a synonym for vicar, and I can't imagine that a professional linguist wouldn't, and if he knew that the popes had been called vicars of Christ since the 5th century, <clears throat> and I can't imagine a biblical scholar of his quality wouldn't, then Thompson was most likely saying, quote, We are wholly indebted to the vicar of Christ, that is, the Roman papacy, unquote. But what a ridiculous statement to the post-revolutionary American mindset! Who would have believed such an outrageous notion coming from even the man who talks the truth? The embattled, degenerate, dying papacy could not possibly have effected the revolution. Anyone foolish enough to run with this idea would have crashed headlong into a wall of ridicule. For Thompson, there was no future in telling what he knew. Since he chose not to undeceive future generations, the American people have lived according to histories that can be contradicted by truth. They have been served by careers and leaders that truth could uh, tarnish and weaken. They seem comfortable in their deception, which is generally the case among consenting subjects to Roman rule. Let's move now to the next chapter wherein we shall see how the Jesuits, which we now recognize as the unsung architects of the Enlightenment, supplied the American colonists a philosophical basis for rebelling against Great Britain. Chapter 14 Called The Dogma of Independence the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum imbued Western culture with a purely Catholic political theory. This theory, as articulated by deist philosophies and politicians, ultimately became the rhetorical mainspring of the American Revolution. It so impacted the world that its formulator and original apologist, a Jesuit priest named Robert Bellarmine, was created a saint in 1930. Prior to Henry VIII's break with the Roman papacy in the mid-1530s and subsequent creation of the Church of England, kings regarded themselves within their respective realms as the anointed vicars of God for secular purposes only. After Henry's schism, Protestant kings assumed God's anointment covered religious purposes as well. They became infallible popes of their own national churches. Following the biblical teaching that the ruler is, quote, God's minister to thee for, go for good, unquote, Protestant kings claimed to rule by divine right, holding absolute sway over their subjects. In the maxim of divine right's greatest champion and James I's private theologian, Sir Robert Filmer, quote, the king can do no wrong, unquote. Divine right's staunchest opponent, was Robert Bellarmine, private theologian to the Pope Clement VIII between 1592 and 1605, who made him Cardinal Bellarmine in 1599. Cardinal Bellarmine appealed to the self-interest of the common man, something the divine right system failed to do. He invented liberation theology, drawing on Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, Thomas Aquinas, that's quite a guy from the 12 1300s over there wow you have to go to, uh, you have to go into a study of Thomas Aquinas more I can advise you uh, Tom mentioned him sometimes in our broadcast before really a, ver a real a, a, a devil in disguise Thomas Aquinas he invented liberation theology drawing 
on Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, Bellarmine maintained that God anointed no kings, but instead gave sovereignty directly and naturally to the people. The people were free to confer their sovereignty upon whomever or whatever they choose. Should the people, people's chosen sovereign prove himself or itself unworthy, the people had the right to dispose him or it, and start anew with any form of government they deemed necessary, whether monarchy, aristocracy or republic. Understandably, the Protestant monarchs loathed Cardinal Bellarmine. A Collegio anti Bellarminalium was established at Heidelberg, Germany, to train Lutherans in how to cope with Bellarmine's democratic egalitarianism. When Queen Elizabeth ordered that Bellarmine be lectured against at Cambridge, the lecturer, while reading the cardinal to refute him, converted to Roman Catholicism. Theodore Beza, who succeeded John Calvin as head of the Protestant Church at Geneva, is said to have declared of Bellarmine's magnum opus, Christian Controversy, quote, This book has ruined us, unquote. Of the process of, quote, making the enemy move as one wishes, unquote, Sun Tzu wrote, quote, The great science is to make him desire everything you wish him to do, and to provide him with all the means to help you in this, without his realizing this, unquote. Thus, liberation theology reached the American revolutionaries through the voice and energies of its principal adversary, Sir Robert Filmer. Sir Robert spent the first four pages of Patriarcha in 1680, his illustrations, his illustrious defense of divine right monarchy, refuting Cardinal, Cardinal Bellarmine. But his re refutation contains so much material from Bellarmine's books that Patriarcha amounts to nothing less than a concise introduction of Bellarmanian theory. <laughs> That's quite funny. You want to disprove something and actually you do is give it more value. The two most conspicuous reviewers of Patriarcha were uh, Algernon, yeah, Algernon Sidney, uh, Puritanism's greatest political philosopher, and John Locke, the voice of enlightenment in England and America. Algernon Sidney's name means little to modern Americans, like so many names read in this book here. <laughs> but in his day, and for generations after, it was synonymous with individual liberty. Babies and country estates were called Sidney in his honor, even though he was beheaded in 1683 for plotting the death of King Charles II. Sidney's philosophical admirers loved his open hostility to Roman Catholicism, they ignored his intrigues with the Jesuits of Louis XIV and his long visits to Rome. Discourses concerning government, his most celebrated work, was known respectfully as, quote-unquote, the noble book. After its republication in 1763, along with an account of his preposterous trial, no indictment, no assistance of counsel, perjured testimony, tainted evidence, packed jury, it could be found in the library of every affluent home in America. Sidney began discourses with the following sentence, quote, Having lately seen a book entitled Patriarcha, written by Sir Robert Filmer, concerning the universal and undistinguished right of all kings, I thought a time of leisure might well be employed in examining his doctrine and the questions arising from it which seem to concern all mankind." Unquote. Whereupon, quoting Filmer's quotations from Bellarmine, Sidney goes on to attack Filmer and in the proceeds defends Bellarmine, who wondrously, how wondrously Sun Tzuan, that a trusted Protestant thinker, would indoctrinate a nation of fellow Catholic bashers with the teachings of a Jesuit cardinal. <laughs> Let me read that again. How wondrously Sun Tzuan that a trusted Protestant thinker would indoctrinate a nation of fellow Catholic bashers with the teachings of a Jesuit cardinal. Here you have Jesuitical sophistry and casistry 
to the utmost. John Locke held such influence over revolutionary intellectuals that historians have labeled him, quote, America's philosopher, unquote. He, too, endorsed Bellarmine by attacking Filmer. On the title page of his two treatises on government from 1690, Locke advertises that he will refute Patriarcha with reasoning, some uh, with reasoning wherein quote, the false principles and foundation of Sir Robert Palmer and his followers are detected and overthrown. Unquote. He then expounds Cardinal Bellarmine in his own words, that will become the rational of the American Revolution. Quote, Men being by nature all free, equal and independent, no one can be put out of this estate and subjected to the political power of another without his consent. Unquote. The personal library of the main author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, contained a copy of Patriarcha and also a handsome folio of 497 pages of the discourses of Algernon Sidney. Quote, if Jefferson read but the opening pages of Sidney's and Filmer's books, Bellarmine scholar John Clement Rieger wrote in 1926, quote, quote, he had the principles of democracy as, uh, as propounded by Bellarmine in a nutshell. It is more than likely, however, that the curiosity of Jefferson prompted him to look more deeply into the original writings of this Catholic schoolman. He had not far to go. In the library of Princeton University there was a copy of Cardinal Bellarmine's work. James Madison, a member of the committee which framed the Virginia Declaration of Rights, was a graduate of Princeton. Probably he read Bellarmine, for at this period of his life he read everything that, could lay his, that he could lay his hands on and was deeply versed in religious controversy. It might be remarked that several members of the committee which drew up the Virginia Declaration of Rights had been educated in England, where the writings of Bellarmine were not unpopular even among those who were most inimical to his face. The operative philosophy of the Declaration of Independence is easily traceable to Bellarminian liberation theology. Now follows a little uh, chart that I have to read here for you. Cardinal Bellarmine, quote, Political power emanates from God. Government was introduced by divine law, but the divine law has given his power to no particular man. <clears throat> Unquote. And the Declaration of Independence reads, The people are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Cardinal Bellarmine states, society must have power to protect and preserve itself. And the Declaration of Independence states, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Cardinal Bellarmine writes, the people themselves immediately and directly hold the political power. The Declaration of Independence states, governments are instituted among men, deriving deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Cardinal Bellarmine says, All men are born naturally free and equal. The Declaration of Independence says, All men are created equal. Cardinal Bellarmine says, For legitimate reason, the people can change the government to an aristocracy or a democracy or vice versa. The Declaration of Independence reads, Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. End of the chart. Now, interestingly, Patriarcha, written in 1680, was not published until 28 years after its author, Sir Robert Filmer's death. It arrived in an era of dwindling hopes for divine right, for, for divine right, the concept having been thoroughly discredited when King Charles I was beheaded in 1625. Could it be that Patriarcha was edited or ghostwritten by Jesuits at the command of Superior General John Paul Oliver between 1661 and 1681? 
the purpose would have been to induce the enemies of Roman Catholicism to follow Bellarmine by having Bellarmanian liberation attacked by a loser, Filmer, the disgraced champion of a lost Protestant cause. The idea is not far-fetched when one considers act the actual outcome, for Patriarcha did in fact produce the theory of revolution that impelled the colonists to create a nation subservient to the black papacy. But for liberation theology to translate into the violence necessary to divide the English-speaking world, England had to commit acts of tyranny. How this was accomplished, despite a dazed and confused and rather innocuous young king, is the subject of our next chapter. So that will be chapter 14, and that is called The Madness of King George II, and that will be something for my next reading. So, it was not that fluent, I had a little bit problem here and there with pronouncing the words, but I hope you still enjoyed the reading of uh, chapter 13 that we went right through now, and I hope uh, to see you all again when I will read chapter 15, well, because I just read chapter 13 and 14, and I will come back for chapter 15, The Madness of King George, in a few days. Until then, do your own study, read the book, not only follow my reading, but read the book for yourself, maybe even get some other interesting books, and until the next time, God bless you, and bye-bye.